It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to our Military and Veteran Continuing Education Series. I'm Dr. Angela Tveda Dick, and I'm a faculty member here um, at William James College and in the Military and Veteran Program. I will be monitoring the chat today, so please feel free to leave your comments and questions. We'd love to hear from you um, and get all of your uh, uh, questions addressed. Today, we have one of our second year students uh, in the doctoral program, Kelly Ray, here to introduce our panel and our talk. Take it away, Kelly. Thank you all so much for joining us today during Women's History Month for our Women's Veteran Panel discussion. Our amazing women warriors will discuss their personal experiences, common misunderstandings regarding women in the military, and what they think the community can help them feel less invisible. The women on this panel bring with them not only their life experiences of being in the military, but also their work in the field of mental health and public service. Women have played a significant role in the military throughout history, yet their contributions have often been overlooked or marginalized, and we're here to talk about their strengths and values that they bring to our community. It's important to discuss women veterans to honor their service, raise awareness of their experiences and needs, and work towards creating a more inclusive and equitable system of care for all veterans. By recognizing and supporting women veterans, we can ensure that we receive the respect and support that they deserve for their sacrifices and contributions to our country. Our country is broadening its views of who is considered a veteran. Just this week, the VA changed their 1959 mission statement to um, which used to read, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to a broader statement which now includes all who have served and reads, to fulfill President Lincoln's promise to care for those who have served in our nation's military and for their families, caregivers, and survivors. Today, we're joined by three panelists and a moderator who are all veterans. Dr. Lori Sutton is a United States Army veteran who now works in, in the political sector, most recently serving as the commissioner of the New York City Department of Veteran Services. Latasha Raymond is a United States Army reservist and a veteran, as well as a current William James College clinical CITES student who's planning on returning to active duty upon graduation. Clara Carr is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. She now works as a licensed clinical social worker for the Manchester Vet Center. Dr. Jenny D'Olympia is a veteran of the United States Air Force and the current director of our Military and Veteran Psychology and Train Vets to Treat Vets program, and will be moderating our panel discussion. Um, just a reminder, the content for today's panel reflects personal opinions of those involved and not the official opinion of the Department of Veteran Affairs or the Department of Defense. Thanks so much, Kelly, for that wonderful introduction to our program today. We're really excited to be here with you. It's my honor to be on this panel with so many strong women veterans, um, and I'm excited about the information that we'll be sharing with you today. Uh, so uh, what would be great if, if you're interested is, could you please introduce yourselves in the chat? Let us know who you are, your connection to veterans, to women veterans. Um, and most importantly, this is the most important is we would like to know what your biggest question or concern is related to women veterans and what you think we as a panel can do to address your, your questions or, or um, curiosity about uh, uh, women veterans in the community and what, what clinicians can do to support uh, our community. And we will be uh, taking a look at those questions as we go throughout the panel. We have some prepared questions, um, but we really hope this is a, a, a conversation with you um, and that includes your um, it, it answers some of the questions that you have brought with you today. If you're nervous about asking those questions in front of the entire audience, please um, ask them privately to Dr. Angela Tavedek or to our um, CE. Um, and you'll be able to um, ask those privately, but we would love to hear what questions that you have. Um, and you can also uh, raise your hand and you can ask them um, as well live if that's something that interests you. So to start, um, I'd like to ask our panel what the, uh, just to share a little bit about our uh, experience and what the mental health community can do to show support for women veterans from our own experiences and our own lives. And then if any of you would like to begin, uh, please, whoever would like to start. 
Sure. So I'll, I'll jump in. Okay, great. You can go. You can go ahead, Lori. Go ahead. No, no, no. Please do. So um, Latasha Raymond here, one of the things I like to say is to not assume, um, don't assume that you know based off of what you learn in books or perhaps what you've seen on television or social media, um, and just to be empathetic to what that person is telling you. They know themselves best. Um, one of the comments that someone said to me recently, which really stood out was, um, he said, oh, well, have you ever mobilized or deployed? And I was like, mobilized, but not deployed. And um, he said, well, at least you dodged that bullet and you have PTSD. And with that, he made an assumption that just because I had not mobilized overseas, that my stateside deployment was OK. So a lot of times we make assumptions where, in all actuality, more people than not have PTSD who have never deployed. Latasha, I think that's a great point. And, you know, what, what it brings to mind is another point related to uh, one of those assumptions is whenever military sexual trauma comes up, so many times people assume, oh, that's a woman's problem. Well, in fact, although the proportion of uh, women who experience military sexual trauma is much greater than men, because of the numbers, actually, there are as many men who have experienced military sexual trauma as women. And there's a very different set of factors relating to both men and women in terms of their reluctance and difficulty of coming forward to report it. Great. Um, and I think, I think there are, uh, just to go off both of your points, there are a lot of assumptions we bring to the table. And I think it's really important, like you both said, to consider each person's experience as individual and even each person's, um, you know, one thing that might, you know, have happened may not define the character of all, all of our, or the experience of who we define ourselves in our role as women warriors. So I think um, another uh, question that we're, we'd like to know about is, um, what does life look like post-military for our women uh, veterans? I'll jump in. Okay, great. I think no matter what rank you were in the military uh, or what level of education transition is difficult for everyone. We'll put that out front. Women veterans, though, are 20% more likely to have financial difficulties, 67% versus 47% compared to men. Um, that's often due to the fact that uh, uh, there are child care issues, there are issues. Uh, in fact, that gets back to the first question, what can mental health professionals do to make it more welcoming to women veterans, have flexible hours, have evening and weekend hours so that women veterans can access that care. Also, the experience of even coming into the military, very different social experiences for women versus men. And I know that a number of our panel uh, members have some really poignant uh, accounts of their experience as moms in the military. I think that's a really good point. What's it like coming into the military and just, you know, my own personal experience, I called my mom and said, I'm going, I'm joining the military. I'm so excited. I've always wanted to do this. And she said, this is not a conversation we have on the phone. <laughs> so, and I think often uh, when our women veterans have, and especially in the past, when we've joined people in the community have said, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? It's not like, you know, we're, 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 we're going against the grain. Um, and it's, it can be a, um, a, another hurdle, you know, going in at just as much as a, it's a hurdle coming out where we're trying to find our peer groups. Yeah. I, I like to add to that. So, to, to what both of you are saying, so the military 
wants or looks at us as like masculine people. They want us to be masculine, have the masculine traits, et cetera, et cetera, right? To be tough. You know, we don't show emotion too much or whatever. And that's like, that's that's really good for us in the military. But it's been my experience that when we exit the military, we're judged um, negatively for those things that, you know, if we are not, bu- you know, typically presenting, if we're not bubbly or we're not smiling a lot and things like that, kind of like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing. That's just how we are conditioned to be. And so a lot of times it's been my experience and some of my battle buddies, so my BFFs, that's what we call ourselves in the military, that we are judged for being assertive or because we don't smile as much. And again, that is assumptions that people are uh, making based off their experience with other folks. So make sure you keep that in mind that this is how we were conditioned to be and there's nothing wrong with us and there's nothing wrong with being assertive. This is who we are. So essentially some people are pathologizing our norm. I want to address the question by Monica Darcy, where she asks, um, I teach courses on the military as a culture, and we discuss the large military civilian divide. How would you describe the divide for women? I mean, myself, I mean, I was in the Marine Corps um, and now obviously, you know, a licensed uh, clinical social worker, but I have a hard time relating to other moms. I have two kids. I, what they talk about is kind of trivial to me like you know the 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 stuff it is hard to relate to like one of my best friends now is actually a police officer and it's because we get each other a lot more than I could with a a typical mom and I don't know if it's just mindset expectations um just mental fortitude in general but it's really hard sometimes to relate to somebody that has never experienced the military just because you can't explain it. It is hard to explain. Um, and it's hard to find a, a it, it's very hard to find a peer group when you're, when you're coming out. Uh, cause the ex, especially, uh, Latasha, you were talking about the experience of, of, of not having feelings and then coming out and you're supposed to have feelings when you come out, you're supposed to show some feelings, some connection, some tenderness, the expectation, the general expectations for how women are supposed to act in the community. And as women military members, that's been trained out of us. Like, so, um, you know, we, we, we struggle to find a peer group, um, that understands us. So we have a a question in the chat that I think is a really good one from Rachel, who's asking, um, since isolation or feeling like an outsider play a role in some of the struggles that women experience? Absolutely, that's the case. I mean, think about the hero's welcome that so many male veterans get. And, you know, as women, oftentimes our response will be to just, you know, sort of uh, slip back and stay in the corners. And uh, if someone recognizes, you know, that you are a, a veteran, sometimes the assumptions as Latasha talked about to begin with are, well, you didn't deploy. Uh, surely, you know, you're doing clerical work, not recognizing that the entire nature of warfare has transformed. There is no front line. Everyone who's deployed is on the front line. And the, the, um, those assumptions, I think, are so uh, demeaning to women that oftentimes we'll, we'll then further isolate ourselves and not put ourselves in a position to have to explain what we did in uniform in ways that men do not. Well, so I have to talk to, sorry, I talked to the panel before um, about, you know, just how different it is um, being a, a, a woman veteran, um, you know, I've had um, friends before who who always ask me, why do you identify as a Marine? Like, why, when you talk to people, why, why is that who you are? She's like, I find it hard to follow up um, after you tell somebody that, like, how, how do I follow up with anybody with that? And for me, it's it's not so much that I'm trying to like one up her because I was a veteran and I was a Marine. It's more so because that's that's my identity. That's who I am. That's ingrained in me. And so 
I think being sensitive of, of veterans, especially women veterans who have, we're 1% of the military population already. And so it's, it's not a pride thing. It's just more of a part of our identity. I think that's a good point. It's not, it's not like you're saying I'm a, I'm a veteran because you want everybody to stare at you and say, good job. You're the best. We're just saying that's a part of your, your, your human, like, this is what, who I am. I identify um, as a woman veteran and as a clinician, I identify with both of those. If you're in a conversation and you say, I'm a mental health counselor, people don't say, why do you call yourself that? It's not, it's not quite the same kind of reception because people don't see when, when you think of a woman, if, when you think of a veteran in your mind, probably it's not one of us that comes to mind because often when we, when we talk about it in the media, when we see the pictures, when we, when we have our discussions, when people tell the stories, it's more about men veterans and there are more male veterans. There definitely are more about male veterans. But our uh, women veterans are the fastest growing population in the military. We're, we now make up 20% of new recruits across the, all services. Um, and we're, gonna, we're projected to continue. Um, we can't go to war without women veterans. So we must change our perception of who a veteran is. We have to look in the community, ask every person if they're a veteran, because anybody could be a veteran. And that's how we can help make our uh, all veterans feel valued and appreciated for their service. So great points. And I like to go back to the one question that was posed by Rachel, I think Wilcox in the, in the chat. So feeling like an outsider, sometimes you don't even have to be out the military to feel like an outsider. And an example of that is I was mobilized as a drill sergeant, injured my shoulder and needed to have surgery. That was for me out of the question because as a female, it's kind of looked at or expected, you know, you're not as strong as, um, you know, like when we think about the, the PT standards, the physical training or physical test standards that we have, there's differences with males and with females, right? And so males maybe have to do a little bit more. And so it's like, oh, well, you passed your PT test because you only have to do 20 push-ups. So um, injured my shoulder a while ago, supposed to have surgery. And I was like, no, because as a drill sergeant, I didn't want to be looked down upon um, because I need to be out for surgery. Or I didn't want to profile, which is like limited kind of duty because I want to still be able to do the same things that my male counterparts. And it's a whole bunch of stuff that I can get into that I'm not, and I'm long-winded. But even dealing with being a female veteran and let's say holidays come up. And if you're a single soldier and you don't have a spouse, who takes care of your children? What do you do? Are people going to say to you, oh, you, you want to leave early so you can take your kids trick-or-treating or so you can take your kids to be this, this, this? No, you don't because you want to be in the end group. So you're going to do what your battles do and then who suffers from that? So those are some things to take into consideration. And also um, with providers, going back to my first question, when I said making assumptions, one of the biggest ones I see is like, we can talk and have communication. I could be crying on the inside and somebody would not know that. And a clinician said um, to me, she's like, you, you don't have any feelings. She's like, you don't love, you don't like you care. And I was like, you will never know. You will never know. I will never show you. I said, I could be bleeding on inside and you will never know. So just because we don't present it to you a certain way, don't assume that we're not hurting or that we don't have things going on. So those are a few things I would like to add. You know, I'm just putting into the chat now, there's a great book that I ran across in preparing for this panel. It's it's written by two badass Marine veterans, women veterans, uh, Kate Kendricks Thomas and Kylan Hunter. It's called Invisible Veterans. What happens when military women become civilians again? I would highly recommend this book as a good reference text as the VA and all of us prepare for this increasing and essential role that we as women play in our country's uh, national security and defense. Hua? Great suggestion. I've read that book. It's a, it's a quick read too. It's uh, easy to follow and definitely worth the read. Right. Um, I wanna add, cause I think we're talking about, uh, I think what I wanna make clear is that we don't want you to feel sorry for us for our struggle. We just want you to treat us like real veterans. 
And I'll, I'll give you an example of that is that my, um, my son came home one day and he gave me a card for Veterans Day. And he said, even though you're not a real veteran, I made you a card. And I was like, well, what, what do you mean? What's a real veteran? What is that? What is that? He said, it's an old man. And because that's that's how they were depicted in a school, and those were the panel discussion, and the they were it was all old men that they had seen. Those are veterans. Uh, but I think that what we hope our panel does, and what you can do in the community, um, is to know again anybody could be a veteran, and we're real veterans too. That's great. You know, that reminds me, Jenny, one of my old bosses, General McCaffrey, he tells a story about his grandson when he was three or four years old and his daughter is in the National Guard and it's Halloween's coming and hey, what do you want to be for Halloween? You want to be a soldier? He says, oh, no, that's for girls because all he had seen was his mom in uniform. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, part of this is socialization and exposure and 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 role models. Um, when I was, uh, you know, I guess I was a full colonel at that point, and I was moving into a new job. My first start, one of my first sergeants had a four year old, five year old kid who, after several hours of moving boxes, all right, looks up at his dad and says, Daddy, is is she your boss? And of course, first start is dying a thousand deaths. Yes. And she, then he goes and he says, you mean you work for a girl? <laughs> so it's important to acknowledge that, you know, we've got great senses of humor, but we've had very different experiences along the way. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing that, Lori. Um, Kimberly asks uh, an interesting question. Uh, it's a more of kind of like a, re a reaction from you guys. Can I assume that the top of the chain of command are already shifting their own thinking of women veterans and active military as equal to their male counterparts? In my experience, no. I mean, even walking through the VA, I, if I see an older gentleman with a Marine Corps hat and I'm like, hey, you know, I served in the Marine Corps too. No, you were a WM. You're a, a woman Marine. You weren't really a Marine. I've had a lot of older gentlemen tell me that. And then as far, I mean, I got out in 2012, but there is still a lot of um, unequalness for, for any females in, in the military. You have to work twice as hard. Um, there's very subjective views of females you have to be very careful with your reputation. You have to be very careful with how you conduct yourself. All eyes are on you all the time. And, and God forbid you're in a relationship and get pregnant, which thankfully I didn't, but th that's the worst for females. I mean, getting pregnant, going on light duty where you're injured, that's all very frowned upon um, for female veterans. Yeah, so you bring up a good point that you're not not only are we the most invisible veterans, but we're the most visible military members. Um, and I think there's I even have seen some some headlines that talk about that, and it's it's talked about in the book uh, that you talked about, Lori, um, by Kate Hendricks Thomas. Um, I think that uh, you know you bring you bring up a good point. People are, but but at the same time, I think. People don't know what they what they don't know, um, and we're in a position to help effect change in the system. Um, when I've run into some things at the at at um, uh, military and veteran medical establishments, I often try to go to um, you know whoever is in charge and tell them you know this is this is how I experienced your approach. Is there another way that you could do it differently? And I'm tell that that. I've been doing that for a long time and that's really exhaust. It really is exhausting. Um, but I think that if, if any of us are in a position to help affect change in that system, that it's, it can be helpful and change can happen immediately. Um, but there are a lot of systems. So, um, you know, these are, these kind of talks, I think are, are ways that we can get the information out about, um, you know, how women 
uh, how women military and veterans are feeling um, in the system. I think there are a lot of changes that have come though, uh, Clara, more recently um, in terms of, at least in uh, how things are supposed to be done and how um, the, because I think there was a rule um, in the army where uh, a, uh, a woman couldn't serve in a unit until there was leadership in that unit. And I think that rule just changed this week as well um, to open up um, more jobs to, to women. So we have a, another question in the chat, which I think is one that a, a lot of providers are probably wondering about. And I know I, as a provider, I'm wondering about as well. So Kelsey asks, do you have any suggestions on how we can better reach the women veterans in our communities to be able to provide these much needed services? So I have a question for the question. Do you mean find, like locate where the female veterans are, or do you mean like a connection with them when you have them in your facility? Uh, finding where the female veterans are. So I think the connection piece, um, so I'm a female veteran myself, so the connection piece isn't too hard for me personally, but I'm finding that a lot of female veterans aren't actually reaching out to access the services that are in place. I think that's a really good point and it's true. A lot of the services are set up to support older men. I think that is one of the barriers to overcome. Uh, I think that women, uh, I think a lot of us, some of us don't identify as veterans. So we don't even realize that's a, that's a role that we play in the community because we, we have bought into the narrative. Um, or maybe we didn't serve for 20 or 30 years. So we think I'm not a veteran because I didn't do that. Or I'm not a veteran because I didn't deploy for a year or I'm not a veteran because I got out early because I, I decided to start a family. So now I'm not a veteran anymore. There are a lot of uh, reasons that I think we, so I think that we ask a different question to women in the community, to all people in the community is, have you ever served in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, or any of the other services? And the National Guard Reserve or active duty, like it's a bigger question than are you a veteran? Because that that's how uh, do do you define yourself as a veteran or not? Maybe you don't and you are. Um, so I think it's really asking everyone. Does does anybody else have any thoughts about how we can reach our? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, so I, I put on my old HR hat for a while and, and say outreach. And I know that's a very broad response, but like I said, I put on the HR hat and that um, when I did work for the VA, one of the things we did is when we, we looked at like who's in positions of, of power, if you will, or leadership, we will compare our stuff to like, you know, national numbers. And so that required us to see like what different populations were in what different areas. So I, I will kind of say that to you all, if you want to put in a little bit of the work, I'm quite sure there's data out there somewhere. And I, and I don't know that where it will tell you where most veterans are going or whatever to be able to see where female veterans are and then start doing outreach in those areas, communities, et cetera. And when I say that, um, it could be, if you know, certain people are at a community center or if they're at, you know, some kind of event they go to or, you know, even laundromats or bus, you know, tr public transportations. So I would say find where they are, wherever the data tells you they are, and then do some outreach activities to bring them in to you because they're there and they need help. And I'd say social media too. I mean, there's a, a lot of groups for each branch or just veterans in general in the New Hampshire area. That's a good place to, to do a lot of outreach. But then also realizing, I feel like even for me, I wouldn't be interested in a group really because I have young kids, work full time, you know, we're dealing with life. And I feel like majority of the groups that I even have or, or people that most engage are the older generation because they're retired. They don't have all those um, responsibilities still on hand. So probably like they said before, weekend after work hours, you know, is going to be the best time that you can actually get women to engage a little bit more. You know, I think also um, the vet centers are a great, great asset. I really consider vet centers as 
the most, I mean, they're really the unsung hero of the VA uh, system. You know, it's a storefront entrance. You can get a cup of coffee, but they've got trained professionals, including a, a marriage and family therapist who's there. Um, it's really an important uh, resource for veterans. And I would also say to give the VA a shout out, some of their posters in the last year or two featuring women, strong women, I just have to say, yeah, you know, when I see them in the hallway of the VA and I go to the VA here at Montrose and in the city, New York City, it just makes me feel proud to be a veteran. And so I think we can send out some of those posters using social media and then also, I got to come back to what you said at the very beginning, Jenny, this deal about changing the VA's motto and mission statement, that's huge. People have been working on that since, you know, almost since Abraham Lincoln said it to begin with. But uh, that's, that's, that's really a huge uh, step forward. And so to piggyback on that, like with the um, the outreach that I mentioned earlier, right now I'm at Harbor Street Community Mental Health in Massachusetts, and they have their own vet center, which is not an official VA vet center. And the director of that program, she actually, she and her staff go out like to some of the homeless communities where they know veterans are and, and get a lot of folks from there because they really need it. And they're most times not going to come. So they go out and do outreach out and where, where people typically are too. Well, to recognize that homeless women veterans are, are dis, disproportionately represented. It's a higher proportion of veterans, women veterans, who find themselves homeless. And part of that is that social isolation, the increased financial burden, the child care issues. And, you know, part of that social isolation has to do with, you know, some of the guilt that we put on ourselves. You know, I don't think that men... Uh, love their children any less than we do as women, but I'll guarantee you no male veteran has ever been asked, oh, you're going to deploy and you're going to put your family behind your career? Every women veteran, whether you're asked that directly, we bring it on ourselves as well. It's a huge burden that we just need to share. We need to un un unshackle ourselves from that, but it's not easy. That's it. Exactly. I think that we even, even as women serving, we carry the same thoughts as the community does. And, and a lot of women uh, military members are, are married to other military members. 50% uh, of our uh, marriages are to other military members and probably a good percentage of those uh, who aren't currently in the military are veterans. Um, so this, the, the numbers don't uh you know, aren't collected there. Um, but there was a study that, uh, done on some Air Force to Air Force couples, and it looked at uh, what the concerns were in the um, in the relationship. And for the male, his concerns were about his rank, his next move, and, you know, his, you know, role. Her concerns were for his rank, his next move, and finally for her rank. Right. So we're even uh, changing our own minds about how we can, uh, you know, create this space where we can also respect the work that we're doing. So we have another uh, comment question in the chat, uh, again from Rachel. Um, another clinical question. It seems that some assessments or intake questions. Uh, don't take into consideration the training culture that military service teaches veterans. Are there resources or suggestions to make sure our approaches are more mindful, especially during intakes? Um, and she talks about working with individuals that experience trauma, you know, informed consent. There could be intake questions that are, are trigger, triggering, um, you know, but would this be, you know, what are some recommendations for that? And um, if, uh, you know, she does do a lot of informed consent with folks with, you know, traumas that they are not triggered, is this style antithetical to how maybe veterans are trained to respond? This is such an important question. I'm so glad that somebody brought it up because it's, it's vital. 
If you can't get through the intake assessment, how are you ever going to get to treatment? And there are ways that you can do this. And in fact, I'll send out a um, an article. My wife, Lori, she's written about this, not specifically for women veterans, but for trauma, people who've experienced trauma and how important it is to start out with resource questions that sort of activate the, the parasympathetic, relaxed part of our autonomic nervous system, and then sprinkle in a couple of the tough questions because you got to take the tough history, but then to go back to the resource session so that you're really uh, mimicking the rhythm of a nervous, uh, a healthy nervous system. It's really important. And then that issue of exposure ties into the therapies as well. I was reading a, an article just you know recently, it was published a year ago, and the dropout rates for the two therapies, prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy, were 56% and 47%. How can you call something a success when half of your folks are dropping out of the treatment? So I think this is a huge issue that all of us can be part of the solution for in helping move forward and getting more people not only to access care and treatment, but to, to stay in and benefit. I think it's also mindful that when you're talking, especially to veterans, you know, one of the things is they're going to be suspicious. They're going to be guarded. They don't want to tell you everything. So especially I work at a vet center. So when I do intakes and it asks about sexual assault, it asks about physical abuse. I let them know that I'm going to ask those questions, but they don't have to respond to me when we're doing a military history and it comes to traumatic events. I tell them they don't have to tell me everything. I tell them I want to build rapport with them first. I want to get to know them. I want them to get to know me and to trust me because nobody is going to open up to you if they don't trust you that you're going to be there non-judgmental when they finally open up to you about their traumatic experiences. So very great points. And I like to jump in and just give you a, an example or illustration of why that's difficult. And I'll give that just from my experience and just a little research that I've done in the military, the army specifically, it's our conditioning process, which starts at the very beginning with your drill sergeants in that, you know, you're shamed and you're ostracized for showing like weakness, or if you get hurt, or if you have to go to like sick call or get, you know, any kind of medical treatment. So we are taught and conditioned from the onset that if you seek help, then you're other than, and you could possibly get put out. So if this is trained and conditioned into us, that's just who we are. Um, because if we admit something hurts or something's broken, then it's a significant possibility that you can be put out. So many times, many of us do not seek the help we need, will not seek the help we need, or tell someone something is going on because there are repercussions for doing that, for saying that something's broken, especially um, serving nowadays with, I know, the VA, DOD um, research sharing agreement. That is, I think that is one of the biggest contributors to people not seeking help is because they can lose their security clearance, they can lose their jobs, which is their livelihood, they can lose their self, um, their their self identity, if you will. So, those are some of the reasons why people are not going to say this is broken, this is what's wrong with me. We've been conditioned not to do that. I think uh, something to add to that for the for the security of your mental health records is it's a big deal in the military. You're, if you see a military psychologist or a military mental health provider, their responsibility is to the mission, which means making sure everybody does the job exactly as it needs to be done. And so your records aren't necessarily completely, you know, the, there's a there's a split between for the provider to give the information to the commander, uh, but then also to try to protect you as well, which is a tough position to be. And that is now where the VA is. But the vet center is incredible in that their records are maintained by according by Congress. They must be maintained separately from the VA medical center's records. So that is an option for people um, who, qual who do qualify for vet center services. And even if they don't, vet centers are really good about helping people find a resource that can help them. I used to work there, so I super love them. I just want to share that. I love yeah. that. Yeah, and the too. great thing is if you're in the reserves too, we don't share anything with the reserves too. Like they might ask for, you know, are they fit for duty, you know, for deployment and stuff like that. And we can keep it very vague, but it's also very safe um, as far as we don't divulge any of that information. 
And I think one thing I wanted to add for when you're working with people who've had significant traumatic experiences, especially for our military uh, veterans, it's not like they had one car accident and that's it. They probably have a series of traumatic experiences, not only that they've experienced, but that their loved ones have experienced. And when I say loved ones, I mean their, their brothers and sisters in arms, because uh, we love all of our people that we serve with. Um and I mean, some of them probably get on our nerves, but we still love them. Uh, but um, I think something that's um, important to think about in terms of doing that trauma interview is how will you help somebody slow down too? You need to go into the interview knowing exactly and being comfortable with how you will help a person not have trauma vomit, basically. And that what that's going to do for you, it's going to protect you as a clinician, and it's going to keep the space safe for the client. Uh, because often if people have never been in any, any uh, therapy before, they think that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to come in there and prove that it's been so bad in my life that I need to see you because it couldn't possibly be just one thing. It has to be all these things. And I need to prove to you that I need to be here. So if you have a way to slow people down, it's going to make them feel safe and it's going to make them trust you. It's not going to scare them away. And so I often say to people, you know, you may, maybe this is your first experience with therapy and you don't have to tell me all the traumas up front. We will get to them. I'm not afraid to hear them. And I'm also okay if we just take it slow and we tell a little bit each time. And that gives them permission to slow down. But you all have your own method of doing uh, therapy and your own, um, you know, you know, whatever background you're bringing in, you need to feel comfortable providing a container for that space so that uh, the person doesn't come in and like literally just, it's almost like ripping all their clothes off there and they feel totally violated and they never want to come talk to you again. Cause that felt so bad to tell you all those things up front. Great examples, Dr. D'Olympia. And maybe this is related to what you're talking about, but we have another question in the chat. Um, do you think that there is such a high treatment dropout rate uh, because of the type of therapy offered? I'll take on this one. I think uh, when prolonged exposure, as an example, was added to or was established as one of the gold standard treatments. This was oh, 15 years ago. It was We didn't have a lot of treatments. We didn't have military specific research. And so it was with the best of intentions that it was a major building block, gold standard in the clinical practice guidelines. But what has become increasingly clear over the years, and it's now being regularly cited in scientific literature by the researchers themselves who are saying, this is this is not meeting the moment. People cannot endure this practice of going to the heart of your trauma and going back to the multi-sensory uh, experience and risking dissociation and further re-traumatization. So I think this is definitely an issue. There are some emerging uh, modalities uh, that don't require this kind of um, exposure. Um, and I think that we have to be professionals about looking at the data and uh, opening ourselves to new and emerging uh, protocols and uh, modalities. Good question. Because yeah, I'm certified in EMDR. And so that's a, a good therapy modality that I can use with my clients that isn't necessarily making them relive the trauma. Um, but really it, it's based on the client and it's based on your style, I think, for what is going to work for a client, because there's not a one size fits all for, for anybody. Absolutely. There's no cookie cutter uh, approaches here that are going to work. And one thing I'd be willing to share with you, there's a study right now going on at Walter Reed uh, about uh, an emerging therapy for PTSD. And I'll be glad to, to send the flyer. If you're working with women veterans 
uh, or any veterans uh, it would be great. They, they need about 40 more subjects to be able to close out the study, but it's a great way to get your veterans exposed to some of the emerging uh, approaches that are out there that are more, uh, that are briefer and, and less um, uh, distressing. And I like to add some some of it is the therapeutic alliance because sometimes we have people come in and we ask some of these questions and it is quite jarring. Um, but I think if a little time is put into that therapeutic alliance where some trust is built and established, then people, if you build that, then people will bring to you the things that are troubling them most. But if they're skeptical about who you are, what you're going to do with the information, they might be a little more reluctant to, to bring those things to you. Safety drives the bus, doesn't it? Definitely. I think something to add to that, Latasha, when you were talking that made me think about be cognizant of why you're asking about the details of a person's traumatic experience. Because if you're asking them because of your own curiosity, because you're new working with veterans and you're not sure about, you know, some particular detail, um, then that's not the question to ask. You want to ask the questions that are going to be important to help with the therapy. So if it's for the client, it's a question. If it's for your own knowledge, because you're trying to understand a particular concept or thing better, that's something better done by seeking consultation or supervision outside of the session with the clients, especially for our veterans. Because yeah, I think it's important to remember that it's not the client's job, and I'm sure most of you know this completely, but it's not it's not their job to teach you what it's like to be them, but for you to be there and the experience with them and to empathically connect um, and to get your information pieces from things like this. That's why we're here today, because we want to help you understand the experience more um, and so that you can reach more uh women veterans and more all all veterans so we had another question in the chat um from kimberly are women veteran able to take i think it's able to take advantage of the wounded warrior project or is there something comparable to that specifically geared for women women are also included in the wounded warrior project the, the Wounded Warrior Project even did their own study about women veterans, and they looked at women veterans' experiences of all the women in their program. Um, and you could probably get that study. Um, maybe we could send it through CE if you want to see uh, the experiences of women veterans who are involved in the Wounded Warrior Project. There are also many women veterans organizations out there, such as SWAN, Service Women's Action Network, they're, and they're doing things to promote equality um, with our women in the service. There are other, there's a Women Veterans Warrior Coalition. There's probably a hundred women veterans organizations out there started by women veterans who wanted to find a way to meet their community, connect and belong. You know, another point uh, that occurs to me, if you're working with a women veteran who is married to a civilian, you know, non-military non, uh, non uh, 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 man, be aware that his experience is very different as well. Um, no one ever asks an army wife, oh, so you're married to a soldier. You're going to follow your husband around for all your career? That's assumed. For a civilian male, it's very difficult to uh, get that kind of repeated, oh, you're married to a soldier, she was a woman, and of course, then the eye rolls and all of the things that we're all uh, well aware of. But it's something, again, to just be aware of that the experiences uh, verge far more broadly than what the stereotypical uh, veteran um, experience or image may be. And there are, there's a lot less research and support on, in the community for uh, not connected to the military uh, male spouses specifically. Yeah. Um, actually, one of our uh, students did a study on to look at their experiences um, just last semester. And we have another one who's doing a study on it coming up. 
Um, and what they, what our uh, one of them that's already completed the study discovered, what which is very interesting, is the male spouses of women veterans who had service experience actually used the system of support less and found it less helpful for them. And I, as a woman, as a I'm going to talk myself through this. As a woman veteran spouse, I I think I find it similarly because which group do you fit in? You're not a you're not exactly a a spouse with no military experience, and you're a woman veteran. So who again, even as a woman spouse, it's hard to find your your peer group. So I think we have about, uh, we have nine minutes left here. I want to see if you have any, um, I think I'm going to go around in our panel here to see if we, we'll first see if you have any additional questions or um, Dr. Tavedic, are there any questions that we might have missed in the chat? And then I'll. No, I think we got to everything. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Well, I want to go around our panel and see if our panel has any um, final thoughts that they'd like to leave our audience with, because um, I'd hate for us to be, you know, cut, cut off without be, having an opportunity to say goodbye. Um, so uh, if you could just think of what you'd like to leave our audience with um, when we think about women veterans um, and what might be helpful in terms of welcoming us home. I would just say, stay curious. I've been so heartened by this exchange and the questions that have come in from our, our listeners and our viewers in the chat. It just has made it interactive and it makes my heart feel good that uh, uh, people are curious about what our experience is. You know, we are strong. We've been through uh, stuff that, um, you know, you can't even imagine. And we're not here for pity, but we do have different experiences. And I think it's so important to embrace us as fully uh, real veterans, but it has to start with us embracing ourselves in that way as well. So we're all in this together. So I will say that um, as women in, in, in general are conditioned to be nurturers and to take care of others, right? Then we come in the military and we have this thing of selfless service and we don't unlearn those things. That becomes essentially kind of who we are. But in that, we we oftentimes forget self-care because we're always taking care of family, taking care of you know others. I would like to say to, to encourage your, your clients to engage in self-care and take care of themselves. They can't continue to do the things that they're doing unless they take care of themselves and that there's no shame in that and that you can't complete your mission unless you are taking care of yourself. Latasha, can I just pile onto that for a moment? Self-care. Liz Stanley, who's a professor at Georgetown, she developed the Mindfulness-Based Mind Fitness Training Program the research is amazing. It's self-care. It's available online for free. The training is available to veterans, to military folks, to family members, to public servants, uh, cops and firefighters, uh, all of us who are on the front lines of community. And I would just highly recommend uh, Elizabeth Stanley and her mindfulness-based mind fitness training it's a bit of a mouthful but it's really great uh, and it's not you know it's not long-term meditation it's attention-based skills that really help us stay uh within our resilient zone and be our best selves i'll say one other thing um uh you know i as a psychiatrist uh, who joined the army in the dark ages back in 1981, you know, I've, I've really been part of this whole swing in society. PTSD was first established as a diagnosis in 1980. And, and, you know, we're learning as we go, but what neuroscience is now bringing forward and in particular uh, shorter, more effective, less distressing ways of uh, healing from trauma. The, the study at Walter Reed that I mentioned 
features one of these modalities. And I would really encourage if you have anyone who's suffering from PTSD, nightmares, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, that you get them uh, uh, forwarded to Colonel retired Mike Roy, and he can get them get them enrolled. I'm excited about the way ahead. I think we've got, you know, just looking at, at the group here that's here today and my colleagues here on this panel, uh, come on, there's, there's no challenge too great. Absolutely. I'll add one last quick thing I know before Jenny close it up. So many times people in class, people in my clinical programs will ask, well, what do we do? How do we connect with veterans? And I said, treat them like people. Be real. Be <laughs> honest. <laughs> And and because people can tell when you're genuine and when people see you care, that means something to them, especially to us. So that that is my number one takeaway. Just be genuine and just care and you'll they'll bring it to you. Great. Thanks, um, Lori, Latasha and Clara. Thanks so much for taking your time out of your very busy schedules uh, to join us today and to share your experiences of uh, being a woman veteran. Um, so you shared of yourself and of your own experiences working with and around women veterans. Um, we really appreciate um, that you're, you're, you're being a part of our uh, discussion series. And um, I appreciate um, you know, having this opportunity to interact with all of you and to be among um, a room of strong women warriors. Um, thanks uh, so much. And thanks also to our audience, because we couldn't have these discussions without your interest. Um, if you didn't uh, come and listen to us talk about our topics and share our information about uh, uh, military and veterans, uh, important mental health topics, um, then uh, we wouldn't have a series. So thanks so much. We hope you will join us again next month. Um, and uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any questions. Thanks so much.